Welcome to the Modern Medicine Movement Podcast with Dr. Thomas Hemingway. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said to yourself, I thought I'd be healthier, in better shape, feel better both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and be further along in my life? If so, come on this journey with my dad as he explores all things health and wellness from a holistic, medical perspective, even as a classically trained physician. He'll share integrative strategies to optimize health and inspire you to join the modern medicine movement. Welcome, 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 everyone, to the Modern Medicine Movement podcast. And a big aloha. Oh, my gosh. Awesome. April. It's April. Holy moly. Thomas Hemingway here. Oh, I'm so excited, so pumped. So much I want to share with you guys. Uh, Just to start out with, I just wanted to give you a big thank you, thank you, a Hawaiian mahalo Oh, for all your great feedback, for listening. We're just hitting the last few days. We hit a thousand, you know, downloads so far. And I know many, many more on the way. I'm just so, so humbled. So grateful for you guys who are taking time out for yourselves, for your health. Oh, it's just humbling. I, I'm just so grateful for you because this is why I'm doing this. This podcast is for you. I want to help you to achieve optimal health, the total and complete health of your body, your mind, your spirit, your emotions, everything health. And I just am humbled and so grateful for you, for listening, for your comments. In fact, uh, let's start it off. I I told you I was going to do this, and I'm so excited. Oh, we got lots of reviews, lots of positive, positive comments. I'm so grateful I'll, I'll read one that says uh, it's from the Nashville Senior. I don't know who that is, but it says, love the enthusiasm, gave me a five stars, and says, Dr. Hemingway has a lot of enthusiasm and knowledge behind his message. Well worth listening to. Thank you, Nashville Senior. Uh, Island Living Lisa said, fantastic, so refreshing to listen to an educated yet down-to-earth doctor giving real facts about health and wellness in an easy-to-understand way. I look forward to more. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. I'm so humbled by that. Another one. Uh, one more, and we'll, we'll, we'll move on. But this is, I'm so grateful for you guys. Uh, Emily SQ said, this is what we need right now, exclamation point. Anyone who knows Thomas Hemingway knows that they want to be around his brain all day, every day. But this is above and beyond. So grateful to have this to listen to, especially with what's going on in the world right now. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I, I, I wish I could just sit and read all of these. It's so humbling. I'm so appreciative. Really grateful for you guys. Keep the feedback coming. Click on the Apple Podcast five star. Give me some written feedback too. I, I love to read it. I read every single one of those, and every week on the show here, we'll we'll uh, go ahead and uh, we'll give you guys a shout out to a couple of those awesome listeners out there that have given some feedback. So thank you. Keep it coming. I I do value that, and I do base my upcoming podcast on what you guys want to hear about. So. Super pumped, super pumped to share this one. I think it's something we all have on our minds right now, something that we all face daily, right? Constantly comes from all different sources. And what's interesting about this is that it can be both vitalizing, motivating, encouraging, challenging, but at the same time, it can even be the opposite, devastating, traumatizing, and even detrimental to our health. And and you might think, how the heck could that be? Something both be invigorating, challenging, motivating, vitalizing, and yet could also be devastating and even detrimental to our health. How could that even be? Well, this, this can, and it's been shown to do that. And what is it? Well, it's stress. We all experience it. It's ubiquitous, right? We all have it in our lives. And what I hope that you'll find that throughout listening and learning today that You don't have to be a victim to it and that we do have a choice. So let's back it up a little bit. What what do you guys think? First of all, tell me, you know, what you think about stress. Do you feel like it's a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it it's somewhere in the middle? Is it neutral? Can it be both? Well, I think I kind of alluded to the answer, but uh, it can be all of the above, right? I know. (laughs) 
Probably many of you hate those silly multiple choice or as my teachers often called them, multiple guess questions, right? Brings us back to those good old days of of school, be it high school, college, whatever, graduate school. And and for me, just the same. It brings me back. And uh, literally, it's funny. I'll share a little bit of this with you because I've been interested in this topic, the topic of stress for over 20 some odd years, right? I literally taken thousands of tests in my life. And and despite not knowing what I know now and, and all the physiology behind it, how I can you know, affect it, 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 et cetera. I didn't always know the nomenclature and what things were called and different reactions and so on. But what I found out early on, and I guess I just kind of found it out on my own and I just, I found that it worked, but for whatever reason, you know, despite the classic, you know, stressors of uh, college medical school, final exams, you know, final anatomy exams, you know, this this stress of this, say, let's say the anatomy final that was coming up, my peers would be just freaking out. And, and, and I just, for whatever reason, I always chose to take the road of make this a challenge for me. I didn't view it as a threat. I, I don't know. I just learned maybe just by the old simple technique trial and error that by, by viewing it as a challenge, it didn't seem to negatively impact me. In fact, I remember like it was yesterday, sitting down and doing a final exam and in my mind just being excited. You know, I was in this testing center that's about as sterile as you could be, right? You got to go in there, show your ID, they check your pockets, you leave your backpacks at the door, like super sterile environment, you know, kind of gnarly. They got cameras, they got people walking around, the so-called proctors, and, you know, it, it was potentially a super stressful event and I would go down and I would sit in my chair and I first I, before I would even open the book I would just laugh a little bit and I just kind of say you know what I'm going to crush this thing I'm going to just do my best I'm going to take it you know as a challenge and just show what I've learned and studied and I I didn't let you know the so-called adverse threat of a test get me down and I found and I didn't know what it was called back then I'm going to tell you today it's called the challenge you know, response, if you will. I didn't know that was a thing. But what I did know is that it helped to look at a stress that way as a challenge. And so I would, you know, take my exams and I would, you know, do my best to remember all those things that I studied. And I took these things as a challenge. And and then maybe later on that evening, I would literally, my wife will tell you, super classic, (laughs) literally fall asleep eating dinner. Like she caught me face planting several times during my, I think this was medical school back in San Diego. And literally she caught me face planting into a plate of spaghetti. I'm sure she's got incriminating pictures somewhere and, and maybe she'll dig those out and share them with you guys on Facebook or something. But it was just, it was hilarious, right? Like I'd be so exhausted and I would literally face plant in my dinner, you know, after a long week of studies or tests or exams or whatever. But during these times, I just felt like the approach that made sense was to take it as a challenge. I, I, didn't, I didn't understand why. I didn't know it was called the challenge response as opposed to the threat response. And we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit today because I think it's going to give you the tools not only to understand it, to understand yourself, your body, what's actually happening, but then to allow that to empower you. And so let me, let me just give you a little bit of... Um, kind of the background of, of what, you know, got me super pumped, excited about this topic. Well, I became familiar with a study way back when, 20 something years ago, 1998, there was a study done on exactly this topic on stress and and how it impacted people's lives. And what happened was, is they took 30,000 people and they asked them two questions, pretty, pretty simple questions. One, do you have stress? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? Do you have stress? Well, I think everybody answered yes. And then, you know, as sort of a part B to that question was how much stress do you have? Is it a high level of stress? Is it a medium level of stress? Is it a low level of stress? Whatever that is. And then the second question was, do you believe that stress is harmful to you? So very, very simple survey, very simple, 30,000 people, they followed them for the next 10 years or so, and what they found is that indeed, as one might predict, right, 
all the things that we've been taught throughout our life. Stress is bad for you. You're going to die sooner. You're going to have a heart attack. You're going to have a stroke. You're going to die young. You're going to get diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, whatever. They, you know, found that those people that had high stress reported the high levels at first glance had a higher incidence of dying up to 43% higher. Those reporting high levels of stress, but this is the most interesting part, but this only applied to the group that believed that the stress was bad for them. Just those that believed the stress was bad, like they'd been taught throughout their lives, stress is bad, stress is bad. Those that believed it and experienced a lot of stress had a 43% higher rate of dying. And over the course of this study, they determined some hundred, uh, I forget what it was, 80,000 people had died somewhat um, from what they attributed to having high stress but not stress alone, but believing that this stress was bad for them. So they they looked at their data and they determined um, through their regression models that it was about 20,000 people a year dying in this country, in the U.S., of believing that stress was bad for them. 20,000 people a year were dying because they believed that stress was harmful. And this, at that time would have been like the 15th leading cause of death, higher than HIV AIDS, higher than skin cancer, higher than homicide. I mean, this is a pretty big deal. Like people are dying. 20,000 people or more a year are dying because they believe that stress is bad for them. So 1998 study, it's a little old, but it's been proven and reproven. There've been a lot of other studies showing similar things. And the interesting thing about this was that those people who reported high levels of stress but did not believe that the stress was harmful to them, those actually had a decreased risk of dying despite the high levels of stress. This is fascinating. So it's not the knee-jerk stress is bad for you. It's your view, your mindset, your attitude that mattered in the end. Wow. Let me say that again. What mattered was your mindset your attitude, the meaning that you gave the stress. If you believed it was bad, well, guess what? It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was bad. If you believed it was not and that it invigorated you and challenged you and, and so on, it was actually good for you. It's literally up to us. We have within us the power to decide how this will affect us. Wow, I just think that's fascinating. Fascinating stuff. It's not what I was taught. What I was taught in medical school was exactly what these authors were anticipating. Stress is bad for you. It will increase your risk of heart attack, stroke, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. It is bad for you. You should avoid it, right? That's what we've all been taught. Well, guess what? It doesn't have to be so. In fact, it is not so much that it is bad for us. In fact, it can be actually good for us. It can be protective, but we get to decide the power is within us. We get to decide. Wow, I just think that's awesome. I wanted to also share with you another study, which I found super interesting, done by Yale. And basically, they took people in their midlife, as they called it, right? They said 35 and up is midlife. (laughs) I guess I'm in my midlife and have been for more than a decade. But uh, anyway, they looked at 35 and up, and they looked at those that had a positive attitude and outlook and those that didn't so much. They looked at a few factors of longevity. They were trying to predict what things would help you live longer, okay? And you know what they found had the greatest effect? Far greater than what I have been telling people for 20 plus years as a physician. Don't smoke. Try to exercise. Lower your cholesterol. Lower your blood pressure. You know, don't get overweight. All these things. Guess how much effect that had on longevity? Well, it was positive, it was beneficial, but only by prolonging um, and giving you an additional four years to your lifespan. That's it. All of those things that I harp on as a physician and I beg people to please quit smoking, please exercise, please have a better diet, all that added approximately four years to their life expectancy. The thing that added the most, up to 7.6 years, almost double, what, what one would think would be sort of the sine qua non would be the, the, the peak of, of what a doctor could advise, right? All those health things. Well, having a positive attitude, having a positive outlook on your life and on aging, 
this could add up to 7.6 years to your life. That's it. Simple. A positive outlook on aging, a positive attitude, which just crushed all those other things. <laughs> I, it's fascinating. Wow. They, it can literally change your life. Another thing they found that can significantly improve your life in the present and the future, giving you a prolonged you know, lifespan, was having trust in others. So there you go. Here's a pearl right here. Actionable step. Have a positive outlook on your life, on your future, on your aging, positive outlook, and have trust in people. And this is one that, you know, throughout the years I've been working on because I think as a kid I was taught to kind of, you know, maybe not trust a lot of people. And so this is one I've had to work on. But it makes a big difference. It makes a difference in how you go about your day-to-day, but it also extends your life. So I will submit to you two things which can improve not only your day-to-day life, but your lifespan by up to at least 7.6 years is be positive. Be positive. Trust people. Having trust and faith in others and being positive is the single most important thing you can do to live longer. And I would submit humbly to live better. The day-to-day, it'll be so much more enjoyable. So on the flip side of that, I got to, you know, shout out to all those negative, cynical people out there, right? They think they're cool. They got all the information. They like to poo-poo people, the naysayers, the pundits, you know, the internet trolls, whatever, right? Well, the opposite is also true in their case. They tend to die younger and live less happily. So maybe this is where the karma comes in, right? But uh, let's not be like them. Let's choose to be positive as truly and literally your life depends on it. Wow, how, how empowering is this? It's so interesting that we can have this significant positive impact on our own lives through our own mind, our own mindset, our own choice. And let's kind of get into why this is super interesting stuff. The physiology, you know, of stress and of this so-called challenge, you know, response that I alluded to, you know, in the beginning versus this traditional negative kind of threat response. Let's dig into this a little bit so we can understand how and why this is the case in our body. So typically, as we all know, you know, we've been taught as kids, you know, in school that when you're stressed, the classic fight or flight nervous system takes over the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which traditionally and teleologically, you know, is uh, the way that we you know, we're able to avoid getting killed by a beast of the field, a lion or whatever it was, right? We, we got our adrenaline pumping, our eyes dilated, opened up real big, our breathing increased, our hearts were pumping, we could run a lot faster, you know, and and if you want to, you know, escape that, that lion that's out to get you, this is a great response, right? The so-called fight or flight sympathetic nervous system that pumps you up with adrenaline and cortisol and and it's certainly beneficial if, you, you know, it's a life or death thing in the short term. But what they found is that repeatedly, if we activate this mechanism, this pathway of the sympathetic nervous system with the cortisol, with the adrenaline, that this chronically activated will actually slowly kill you. It's bad for you. It's not good. But a different response to a you know, similar or, or the same stress that we now have a name for that, that I gave you earlier the challenge response can be nearly the antithesis of this, that not only will it act to mitigate these negative effects of the, of the classic, you know, adrenaline, you know, cortisol, uh, sympathetic nervous system, but, but it does this on a level where it mitigates the bad things and actually has positive um, results as well through a hormone referred to as oxytocin. So, I think many of you may have heard about oxytocin, right? Sometimes it's called the cuddle hormone, the tend and befriend hormone. It's gotten a lot more press in the last 10 years than previous. When I was in medical school, the only thing we ever learned about oxytocin was it was important for childbirth, right? It helped with labor contractions. In fact, uh, those that are in labor are often augmented and given additional oxytocin to kind of speed up the labor process, um, helps the uterus contract later as well. It also helps with milk letdown for breastfeeding. You know, we're, we only sort of studied it in this sort of physiology related to childbirth. Well, guys, we got it too. We got oxytocin too. And no, it's not going to make us have babies or anything like that, but it will help us when we 
choose to have our stressor be a challenge rather than a threat. And so what happens is when we undergo the challenge response as opposed to the threat response, we choose, right? It's in our minds. We choose oxytocin is released from the pituitary gland. That's where it's stored. It's made in the hypothalamus, but it goes and, and hangs out waiting to be released in the pituitary. And then when this happens during the challenge response, it actually does the opposite of the traditional stress response. It dilates our blood vessels as opposed to constricting them, right? Because if we were running from a lion and we happen to get cut, slashed, lacerated, we'd want our blood vessels to clamp down so that we didn't die of hemorrhagic shock or loss of blood. Well, here, the oxytocin actually dilates the blood vessels, encourages better blood flow, right? To our minds, to our hearts. It actually encourages increased cardiac or heart activity, cardiac output. Also, it encourages healing, it's so interesting. It's almost the, the opposite of what happens with the cortisol adrenaline reaction. It also, the oxytocin also can increase our pain threshold. It can even have an anxiolytic effect, which is that, you know, it makes us more calm, helps us be able to better deal with whatever stress is happening to us. It has a, has a mellow, a calming effect. And like I said, it can also promote healing. And what it also does is encourages us to reach out and connect socially. It's sort of like a social hormone, if you will. You know, like I said, some people refer to it as the cuddle hormone. In fact, if we do, you know, go and, and, and give a hug to whoever may be sitting next to us or next time we're, we're not by ourselves in our car listening to our podcast, we give our family member, friend, or wife when we get home, whatever, a hug. That hug actually increases the release of this oxytocin, the cuddle hormone, which can do all this good stuff for us. It helps us to heal, helps us to dilate our blood vessels, improve blood flow, and it helps relax us. It makes us more mellow and calm and also helps us to reach out and connect socially. What better time in our lives right now than to have connection? Right now, we're all stressed out about the coronavirus and the social distancing. And what I would, would plead with you is that you look for ways to connect because social distancing does not have to be social isolation. You can socially connect, right? You can connect with those in your immediate uh, environment, your family. You can connect with those, your friends, and so on through all the myriad of internet uh, tools we have, Instagram, Facebook, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever it is, but we can still connect. So social distancing does not have to equal social iso isolation. In fact, I hope and pray that we can connect more with others than ever before because we need it. We need it for ourselves. They need it. In fact, this oxytocin thing I'm telling you about, so interesting. We can increase and encourage its release in our own bodies through this social connection. They've even begun, because it's so promising and so interesting, they've begun to study it. You know, they're doing uh, lots of research now to look at ways that they can use it to treat a lot of these disorders that, that are caused by increased stress and that get worse with stress and that have all these adverse um, effects, like, for example, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorders, major depression. They're looking at the ways that oxytocin may be able to actually help with these disorders. How interesting, right? And another study I want to share with you, which I find fascinating, was of 1,000 adults once again, over the age of 30, this one was 34 instead of 35. Maybe they thought 34 was the <laughs> beginning of midlife. I don't know. But anyways, they looked at people, 1,000 people, in fact, that had undergone a serious life event, be it a heart attack, a death of a family member or close one, a divorce, bankruptcy. You know, I don't have to tell you guys that these things are stressful, right? In fact, if you asked you know, the people at large, and you did a survey, you'd probably get the three top causes, at least as of today, when I was last looking at this, <laughs> of stress in today's society um, are, besides, you know, the imminent uh, thing that's around us all day long, the coronavirus, but the three traditional things are money, our work, and our health. 
And right following that was relationships. So these things are stressful to us, right? And so they looked at people who had undergone some serious uh, stressful event. Uh, usually it was something like death in the family, bankruptcy, divorce, uh, serious health event, heart attack, whatever. And then they looked at how this affected their life. And they found that out of these 1,000 adults, 30% of them did have an increased risk of dying after their serious life stress. But that there was a group of those who had this completely mitigated, completely went away, that increased risk of dying went away because they took time to socially connect and care for others. And in fact, did they not only have a decrease in their death rate, but they actually did better in the long term, their life expectancy, their happiness levels, this social connection that they received from helping others, even in the time of their own adversity, right? Maybe they were going through, like I said, heart attack or divorce or bankruptcy or death of a family or or a loved one, whatever. They reached out during this time and socially connected and helped to care for somebody else. And that was protective for them through this whole pathway of the oxytocin and the healing that goes through. And so not only did they help others in this time, because they reached out and they were being helpful and they found that, you know, in their own depths of challenges and problems, the thing that helped them get out of it was to reach out and help somebody else. So they helped somebody else and their connection was what saved them, their connection. We all know this, right? I mean, when I was a kid, my parents always told me that if I was having a bad day, the quickest way I could get that to turn around was to look for somebody in need, somebody that I could help. Maybe it was my sibling that I was mad at. You know, I got four brothers, right? There are five of us boys, and we would get mad at each other all day long. And my parents said, look, if you're having a bad day, quickest way to turn that around, just look for something you can do to be helpful, to reach out, a smile, you know, uh, lighten their load a little bit, carry their groceries, do the dishes, whatever. You know, in my house, it was like sweep the floor ad nauseum because (laughs) with Five boys, that kitchen was never clean. So we, were, we did a lot of sweeping. But, but reaching out and connecting will save us and help so many others in the process. And I can't think of a better time than right now during this social distancing, during the stress of so many millions of people who have lost their jobs with illness from this virus and other things. What better time do we have to reach out and connect with people to help, to do something positive. And not only will this, of course, help them, but you, you, yours truly, numero uno, will also benefit from this. So cool, so cool. So it's no secret, um, I think, that that serving and helping um, can be helpful. But, but even scientifically, down to a physiologic level, this has been shown through this hormone, oxytocin. Isn't that fascinating? I just think, I just think it's incredible. I just, I love science, right? Better living through science, or as my chemistry teachers used to tell me, right? Better living through chemistry. But, but what I found is that having this knowledge and understanding our bodies better, we can convert stressful, stressful situations into growth, experiences into the challenge response and we get to decide in our own minds how we can deal with this and if we're going to release a whole bunch of adrenaline um, by itself or if we're going to add to that a whole bunch of oxytocin and we're going to come through it better than ever before our hearts are going to be healthier we're going to be able to reach out and affect more you know, lives positively. It's just so fascinating. I mean, even this can be applied to even things that, that seem not so much related, say like our fears, you know, maybe it's a fear of public speaking, a fear of, I don't know, skydiving, a fear of whatever, you know, um, flying in an airplane, whatever our fears, a lot of us have different fears in life. And what they found is using this same study of the mind and mindset and using, you know, your ability to decide that stress can be helpful, invigorating, challenging, rather than harmful, that you get to decide the outcome. This is fascinating. They've taken this all over the world. There's, there's um, 
I'll put in the show notes um, some of the, the folks who have really looked into this a lot through their studies, and a gal named Kelly McGonigal even wrote a book about this, which I read a few years ago and still remember a lot of the uh, scenarios she, um, she shared. It was called The Upside of Stress. Fantastic read. I would highly recommend it. Um, a lot of other folks that she quotes their research in her book. And, and one of them, I think, was it was about a group of um, basically skydivers, right? You would think that those that love to skydive, the adrenaline junkies that do this as their job, you know, the so-called instructor, you would think that they would have a lessened, you know, um, response to, you know, palpitations, heart rate uh, uh, increasing during that, and the traditional sh- sort of signs of that exciting, you know, stressful event, you would think that when they looked at them, the seasoned skydiver versus the first time novice skydiver, you would think that the novice skydiver would have a way higher heart rate. They would be way less, you know, calm. They would be way more freaked out. And so they would show all the signs of sweaty palms and rapid breathing and increased heart rate way more than their instructors. Well, actually what they found was super interesting because the instructors were so familiar with this and they loved it that it invigorated them that for them it was a challenge it wasn't for them they've been through this a million times it wasn't life or death but it was invigorating and it was challenging and it was enjoyment you know pure adrenaline pure enjoyment they found that their heart rates are were actually above those of the novice and what they what they were able to show through that is that they were able to use that to their advantage, you know, and, and this can help us like say those of us that go through stress, um, upon getting into an airplane, you know, irrespective of what's going on now, I I don't want to get an airplane now unnecessarily either, but I mean, those of us that have true significant, severe flight anxiety, what they found is that we can use those triggers, which we'll get with the typical, you know, stress response, that sympathetic nervous system that we talked about, the adrenaline, cortisol that pumps us up, that increases our heart rate, makes our palms a little bit sweaty, makes our armpits a little sweaty, whatever. We can actually use those in our mind as positive, invigorating things that tell us that we're alive, that we're able, that we can conquer, that we can, you know, get through this and out on the other side in a positive way. And and they've been able to help literally thousands of people overcome their stress and anxiety of these kinds of things by recognizing these physiologic, you know, occurrences like an elevated heart rate or sweaty palms, but to spin that in their minds as something positive. Like for example, when I first went on a date with my wife, (laughs) this is pretty funny story, but I literally, I mean, yeah, I was a little nervous. I'd never met her. We went out on a blind date went on a hike and it was awesome. We were in Hawaii and, and, but it was a little bit nerve wracking and it got even more so at the moment that I literally slipped, fell and did a full face plant right in front of her on our very, very first date. And yeah, you know, I was a little bit butterflies, a little bit, you know, sweaty palms, heart racing, but it was exciting. I didn't view it as a threat. I was excited and, and I guess it all worked out, right? I've, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> been with her for about 23 some odd years. We're married this summer, 22 years, and it all worked out. So it's the way that we take those events and even what's happening physiologically, our rapid heartbeat, our sweaty palms, and we get that feeling of invigoration, of excitement, of, you know, just think of something really positive that also gave you, you know, those butterflies in your stomach or the sweaty palms or whatever that it will be invigorating to you and end up positively. And and through this, through our mind, through this prep ahead of time of basically telling ourselves, look, you know, when I get up and I speak in front of those 10,000 people at this big convention, you know, when it's happening next year, when all this is over, I'm not going to get stressed out. I'm going to feel invigorated. I'm going to be excited. You know, when they look, look at the super successful athletes, that perform really, really well under pressure. They've looked at this in Olympians, for example, and what they found is that, yes, they get all those same things, right? They get an increased heart rate, they perspire, they, you know, have their eyes dilated, they they have their breathing enhanced and, and, and increased, but they spin that in their minds as invigorating and they love the challenge. And so, yeah, do you think they have a little bit of quote-unquote you know, nerves to be performing at the Olympic level? Well, 
well, they probably have some nerves, but they, those that are really successful at it, they use their minds to basically decide that this is not a threat. This is not a stressful event, if you will. This is a challenge and an invigorating you know, event which will help propel them to victory. It's just a fascinating, I, I could go into all the studies that have been done on athletes and Olympians and this mindset work, if you will. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's so encouraging. It's so just intriguing. I find it, frankly, I find it fascinating, especially now that they've developed you know, a, a biochemical pathway that helps to explain how this all works out through the release of you know, oxytocin, for example. I just think it's fascinating. And then to be able to use that in avenues for other treatment of conditions, like I mentioned before, anxiety, depression, PTSD, all this kind of stuff, fascinating. But they found that, you know, as if not the most important thing with all of this is our own mind, what is within us. It's as a person thinks, so is he or she, right? That is true today as much as it ever was when it was first voice way back in. We get to decide this, the power of our mind. It's just, I think I just love it so much because it, it really, you know, since I was young, I just always believed there was more to us than just simple chemicals and physiology, right? I mean, we can explain you know, a little bit of this through, through that, but our minds are powerful and they're connected, you know, uh, with our spirit, our body, our, you know, we're all one complete whole, one complete unit, and we can benefit so much if we decide today that we want to be positive, that we will view whatever stress comes our way, we're going to view it as a challenge, not a threat, not something that will kill us, but as something that we will come on the other side stronger, more capable, more loving, caring, able to give. We're going to come out of this whole virus thing stronger as a people, as a country, as a world. And I truly believe that. I believe that it's within each of us to make that determination. And yes, we're going to have some biochemical pathways activated with oxytocin released and the healing and the social connection that comes with that. All that's going to happen, but concomitantly and in our minds, the thing that I think What's most promising is that we have this within us, that we can do this. We can affect the outcome. As Les Mills said, and I got to see him in person before, he always loves to say there is greatness within you. And I truly believe that there is greatness within each of us. And we, through the power in our own minds, can decide today how we are going to respond to whatever stress happens in our life. And I would encourage you guys to, to read the show notes and the um, things that the books and things that I've read that have been helpful to me in this re- regard over the years. And, and just be positive because like I said before, be positive because your life depends on it. Your life depends on it. So have hope, be joyous, reach out, connect with those around you, even though it may only be through a social media avenue, have that connection. You will be better for it. They will be better for it. We can all get through this. We can, we shall, and we will. And I pray that it'll be with this positive, activating, invigorating, you know, challenge mindset in the face of adversity and stress that we will all certainly face and continue to face throughout our lives. And we will do so in a way that we will survive, we will overcome, and we will prosper. So that's that's it for today. Enough of, enough of the banter, but I just want to tell you that I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share what I've learned, what I've studied, what I've experienced, and that this has been something so meaningful in my life and continues to be on a daily basis. The power of positivity, the power of our minds, especially as we face, you know, all of these stressors that come our way, we can and we will survive and we will prosper. I feel that. I feel that in my bones. I just, I know that we can do this and uh, I'm just so grateful to be here with you to share this and I would encourage you to share this podcast with anybody you think could benefit share, you know, our movement. This is, in my mind, the modern medicine movement where we will together achieve
achieve optimal health. Our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our emotions, even our financial health. We're going to do all of that. In fact, I got an upcoming podcast specifically on financial health, which I think is super pertinent to the times. And so until then, a big giant virtual hug, lots of oxytocin release, and a giant aloha.